Good morning, Wabash. Um, so let's see, where were we last time? Um, all right, so last time we had written this code, but we hadn't actually gone through and executed it yet. Um, uh, we, uh, we wrote the assembly, right, which is the, the third column, and uh, then we translated it into the actual machine instructions. That's the second column. And the memory addresses are the first column, um, but we haven't actually run this thing yet. So, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, goodness. Okay, so what we need to do to run this and load it into Joel's emulator is basically just make, uh, take all of the instructions and just smush them all together as a big long string. And, uh, all right, so what do we have? We have 20802100220230124FB5524 8650B612B018 5112 This is going to be annoying. 5223 uh, B zero zero A three one F F and finally the halt C zero zero zero. Okay, so that's just all the instructions that we had before, uh, just smushed together, um, and then we want to go to Joel's emulator. Um, and then uh, we just put that after the pound sign and then refresh it and it loads it in. And there's our instructions in memory, so we're good. All right, so let me uh, expand this so we can see it better. Um, okay, so what was the, uh, well, actually, before we do that, let's just remind ourselves what's the, what were we trying to do? Um, we were basically doing this right so we were just uh we made up a silly while loop um to do uh basically a counter and um uh what this will do right is count through um it'll actually count the triangular numbers so uh when this starts right what are the values that the num num goes through it starts at one and then the first after the first loop iteration runs it then is two and then three and so on okay but what about the answer variable ands at first it's zero the first time the loop runs it's one then the second time the loop runs it's three then the third time it's six, right? Then 10, then 15, and so on. Okay, so those happen to be called triangular numbers because of um, um, uh, that sequence uh, for, well, basically because of number theory. Uh, I don't wanna get, get into that right this instant, but, uh, Right, those, that's what we're, we're computing here, okay? So uh, if we run through this, okay, so let me blow this back up, right? And if I clear and run, then, I mean, at first, right, notice that the, uh, we just got to load everything into our registers. Okay, we start doing the addition. Okay, so watch registers, watch the registers.
Okay, so we did 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 here because we stopped if we were short of, we wanted to be less than 5, not equal to 5, right? And so what got spit out, 0a, okay? Okay. Um, and in our case, we hard coded the um, we hard coded negative five, right? So if we wanted to say see if something was less than five, what were we really doing? We were seeing if something minus five was less than or greater than zero, right? We were comparing it that way, right? And so. The, the line of the code that, or the part of the code that, that was the minus five is this dude right here, this FB, right? So if I change that to FA, it's uh, minus six instead of minus five. And if I change it to F9, it would be minus seven and so on, okay? Um, so, uh, so let's actually do that. Let me just change this one thing right there to FA. Um, and then let's run it again. And here we should get, uh, instead of 0A down at the bottom, we should get 0F, which is 15 in uh, decimal. Uh, when all is said and done. Okay, so notice while this thing's running, uh, pay attention to the program counter. You see how it's looping, right? It uh, it gets up to, right, 1.6 or 1.8 or something, and then it goes back to being 0 something or other, right? Um, so that's right how we're implementing the loop, right? So a loop... Uh, because what what you know any architecture really does is it uh, the program counter stores where to load the next instruction out of memory, okay, and uh, if you and and the jump instruction changes the program counter, right? So it allows us to either jump forward or backwards in memory. And by carefully setting that up, we end up with, in this case, a, uh, a loop. Uh, so how many jump instructions did we use in this particular program? We needed three the way we wrote it. Okay, at minimum, we would have needed two. Um, one of them... Basically, uh, we used to, um, uh, the first one was basically, should we or should we not enter the loop? Okay. And then the, uh, that was basically this group. In our case, we used two of them. Uh, B612 and B018 was, should we or should we not enter the loop? Okay. And then... We would also need something at the bottom of the loop to send us back up to the top and start over, right? And that's what this this one was uh, there, B00A. It sent us back up to uh, recompute the stuff that determined whether or not we went into the loop again and then checked should we enter the loop again, yes or no, and... Right, we either do or we don't. Just depends on the numbers. Okay. Um, all right. So that kind of makes sense. Um, and then the the last thing, right, was um, notice that two of the three jumps in this case. Right. So what's the uh, what's the syntax for the jump instruction? B number memory address. Right. So you do B is the opcode for jump. The second thing there, the number is which register you're comparing against register zero. And then the last two are the memory address to which you would jump, your target. Okay. Um, okay, so in our case here, we had our three jump instructions were B6, 
one two, B zero one eight, and B zero zero A. Okay, so B zero, the zero there, which register is getting compared to register zero? Register zero. The one eight or whatever is the memory address that you would jump to if the loop if the jump is successful. Okay, so um, so B zero one eight. If we execute that instruction, what will definitely happen? Huh? It will jump right. So doing B zero something something is an unconditional jump. Okay, meaning that does the jump get executed no matter what? Yes. Okay. And um, uh, now contrast that with the, the B612 instruction. What happens there? What gets compared to register zero in that, uh, this one, uh, B612, this, this jump right there? Which register gets compared to gets register zero? Register six. And the contents of register six <clears throat> may or may not be the same as the contents of register zero. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. But it's not guaranteed that they are. Okay, whereas if you compare register zero to itself, no matter what's in there, it's the same as itself, right? So that was the trick to do a unconditional jump. Okay, does that kind of make sense? Um, okay, so uh, if we wanted to spruce this program up a little bit, um, uh, in our case, the this bit here for um, the value of negative five or negative six or whatever, we just hard coded that, um, but we could have made it actually had the excuse me, had the program uh, compute that as we went, right? So uh, how did we get FB or FA uh, where my mouse cursor is, right? So the value of minus six or minus five or whatever. Well, we started with the value of five and then we flipped the bits and added one, right? To get the negative version. We never told this particular program to do that, okay? I just did that part by hand, uh, mostly just to simplify the program so it wasn't quite so long. Um, but we could have added that in, and then uh, if we wanted to do the 32nd triangular number, we would have just changed the uh, five to a 32, well, it'd be in hex, obviously, but, uh, and then rerun the program and everything would do it. And we would get the 32nd number here instead of the fifth or sixth or whatever. Okay. Um, right. Okay. So does that kind of make sense? We, no. no. See? Uh. Okay, so uh, let's see where we want to go next. Um, now, basically, um, <laughs> this piece of code that we wrote last time, this was, I think, the very first assignment in <laughs> CS241 back in August. Okay, and then, and in this other tab, uh, this, this document that's only available in a PDF, uh, well, it's 8,000 pages, right? That's the, uh, the architecture reference manual. And so I had to go dig in the manual and find something yesterday and all 8,000 pages. It was kind of fun, huh? What? <laughs> yeah, that would be kind of like uh, a Himsel reading, right? Just surprise. You've got 8,000 pages. Um, no, it's, it's uh, well, I mean, let's just open it and I'll show you, right, is, um, right, here's what it looks like. Right, so it's, 
I was looking up this stuff for the uh, binary encodings for an instruction on the ARM processor for doing vector processing that has an immediate offset. And yeah, so this was my afternoon yesterday. Isn't that fun? Yeah. Doesn't this just fill you with joy of taking CS241 call? No. No? You'll get there. Don't worry. Right. Or Owen or anybody else that wants to do CS as a major. Anyway. Uh, okay. So let's see. Uh, let me go back to close this. Um, let me go back to Overleaf. And let's look at... Uh, let's see. Oops. Nope, this is the right one. Okay, so let's, we did subtraction, conditional routines. We just did a loop. Okay, we can go through the spicy example of the Fibonacci's. Actually, that's uh, we've done pretty good here. Um, all right, so let's uh, let me just download and open this so that we can have it. Yeah. Um, okay, so. Um, one of the examples that I've got here is kind of interesting. Okay, so um, let's uh, let's look at this code. It spanned two pages. Uh, so what I was doing here was uh, I wrote a program that generated and computed the Fibonacci sequence. Okay, so what's the Fibonacci sequence? You guys happen to remember from... One, one, two, three, five. Okay, so how do, how is that sequence generated? The next term is the sum of the previous two. Okay, so one and one are the two starting values. Okay, and those are just predefined. And then the next value is the sum of the previous two. So what's one plus one? It's two, so the next value is two. All right, well, what's the value after that? 2 plus 1, which is 3, and then the value after that is 2 plus 3, which is 5, and then the value after that is 3 plus 5, which is 8, and so on. Okay. Uh, good? Okay. So, uh, this particular example, uh, let, me, uh, let me load this into the emulator, okay, in a second, uh, basically goes through and does that. So, the uh, the code for this is is similar, but obviously not identical to the one that we did in the previous example, uh, namely the uh, uh, we're going through a loop and adding some stuff up, right? Uh, it's just that this time it's adding the two previous numbers, and rather than the uh, uh, rather than the uh, the number one every time, basically. Okay, so. Uh, but what makes this program fun is that it actually is a self-modifying program. So the program overwrites its own code as it goes. Okay, so let me load it and let's see how that worked. Oops. Oh, that should have been a pound, not a percent. Sorry. Uh, okay, womp womp. Uh, I've got a broken link. That's not good. Let's see why the link is broken. All right, let's load just this part. Yeah, but that's not valid because the first uh, instruction is 0, 0, 0, F. It can't be that. Oh, it's because I got two pound signs. There we go. Okay. 
Uh, so I need to put in, let me look at the code. Um, we load zero with FF, memory address FF. Okay, so let me just put in here zero six, and we'll just start generating six um, Fibonacci's. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is while this is running, oops, let me look at the, find the spot. Um, pay attention to memory address um, pay attention to memory address 1 uh, D okay so pay attention to this memory address right here Okay, and uh, here I need a one and a one, by the way. Because those were the two uh, starting Fibonacci's. Okay, so watch, let's watch this. Okay, so like I said, pay attention to this memory address right there, that where it's an eight two. What happened? It went up by one. Okay. This is where I'm storing the numbers as I compute them. Okay, so I just chose to print them basically by storing them to a segment of memory. It just went up again. Okay. And so let's think about why that happened. Okay. Uh, this instruction. 3385 takes whatever's in register 3 and stores it out to a memory address. So what I did was I added 1 to the value uh, that's in register 5 and then I overwrote this address in memory each time I wrote the pro ran the, uh, the loop. So this, this program modifies its own code. Now, it does so very subtly, only in one little tiny spot, okay? But that's how I got this thing to print them in sequential order by, well, by when I say print, I mean uh, store them to memory. And so what I started with, of course, was one and one. Uh, those were the two starting values of Fibonacci's. And then what did it do? It, put, it computed two, and put it here, three, five, eight, and so on, okay? And those, that's the Fibonacci sequence, right? Well, that's kind of cool, right? So um, I think uh, when we started talking about this, I, um, one of the things I mentioned was that there are sort of two different ways that we could set up a machine architecture. And they were called a Harvard architecture or a von Neumann architecture. Do you guys remember that? Briefly, vaguely, maybe. Okay. All right. So in a Harvard architecture, I couldn't have done this trick. Okay. And because a Harvard architecture, the instruction part of the code and the memory part, like there are two different part, pieces of memory. There's a piece of memory where instructions go, and there's a piece of memory where, well, other stuff goes. Okay. And, um, the instruction part of the code is sort of fixed, if you will. Now contrast that to a von Neumann architecture, which this is, this uh, Brookshire processor, where there is exactly one piece of memory, right? There's, there is memory. There's no, like, instructions go here and everything else goes over here. It's just there is a single chunk of memory and code or data can go in any place within that, okay? So in this case, uh, what I was able to do 
was because there's no real distinction between code and data, I could make the program overwrite a piece of memory that happened to be where one of its instructions was, and in doing so, make the program modify itself. Okay, now, obviously, you have to be exceedingly careful if you're going to do this, because if you just start overwriting stuff willy-nilly, then what's going to happen? You're going to generate garbage instructions, and then it's not going to work, and everything's going to explode, and right there will be much wailing and gnashing of teeth. Yeah. Okay, wailing and gnashing of teeth is from... Huh? Well, yeah, but... Okay. Uh, all right, so anyway, does that, that kind of make sense? So, um, yeah, uh, there's that. Um, okay, so uh, I think that actually kind of finishes up our uh, discussion of bricks here. We're a little, little early. Um, or the machine architecture. So I'll give you guys basically a small assignment to do to write a simple program in this just to kind of get your feet wet. Um, but uh, those of you who want, are going to uh, uh, major in CS or, or even minor, um, you know, that are interested in that, uh, the CS241 class is basically this kind of stuff for the entire semester. Okay, so it's real low-level programming. Now, it's not with this toy architecture. We start there just to kind of get our feet wet. But then what we're doing is... Uh, well, let me just let me just pull it back up. Um, Let's see. Let me open another example. Well, actually, here, let me just close this project. Open. Say, for example, this project. Okay, so what they're producing is, it looks kind of like what we were writing, only it's the assembly for a true processor. And um, uh, right, okay, so here what I did was, uh, um, what I'm doing is take computing a uh, one over the square root of a number using the most evil, dirty trick to do it under the sun. But anyway, um, okay, so this is what, uh, uh, if you take CS241, those of you who are, like I said, interested in majoring and minoring, right, we're going to take this sort of Brookshire stuff and do it for a real processor. And uh, now, a real processor has a whole lot more instructions than the Brookshire one. So even if we look at a processor, say, from the 70s, uh, I, I think I've talked about the MOS 6502 quite a bit, which was uh, one of my favorite processors because what did it power? Yeah, the Atari, the 8-bit Nintendo, the Commodore 64, which was my first computer, by the way, was the Commodore. Um, so... Uh, anyway, that architecture had a hundred and something different instructions. Uh, the Brookshire architecture that we've been playing with, which doesn't really exist, right? It's a, basically an educational toy, uh, had 12, right? The ARM instruction, like current generation ARM architecture, which is what all your iPhones are using, 
right? How many different instructions are there? There's hundreds, hundreds upon hundreds, thousands even, right? It's a very big instruction set, which is why that manual that I was loading earlier has 8,000 freaking pages in it, right? Because there's just a lot of stuff to document. Um, okay, so the instruction set is a lot more rich, which means that you can do a lot more stuff without it being a giant pain in the butt. Um, and, uh, right. Okay. So, um, anyway. All right. Uh, so we've got a little bit of time left. Let's just remind ourselves what, uh, the sequence of events for the next week and a half, right? Because we basically have all of next week is classes. And then the week after that, what do we got? Monday and Tuesday is classes. There's nothing on Wednesday. That's basically time for you guys to start prepping for finals. And then there's finals. Yay. Okay. All right. So what are we going to do next week in class? Party. Yes. Um, we're not having class next week. Okay. What are we doing instead? Yeah. Well, we'll do it by Discord, but yeah. So everybody, uh, and I need to, to generate the schedule and send it to you guys. I'll do that later today. Um, for which day and which time I want to meet with you. Okay, so I want to do one-on-one -on -one meetings for about eh, five minutes or so each uh, just to kind of see where is your project and how is it coming along, the game project, okay? And uh, so we'll do those one-on-one -on -one meetings via Discord next week, okay? Which means, and none of you have done this yet, and I can tell, uh, what have none of you done yet? Unless you had already done it, like, way a long time ago. None of you have joined my Discord server. Okay. When did you do it? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so... Unless you did it at the beginning of the year, uh, none of you have done it in the last week. Okay? So, if you haven't already done it, please do so. Right? Download the Discord application and uh, get it going. And then, what, uh, what I'd like you to do is, uh, so if you're on a Mac, you need to basically give it permissions to record the screen, right? To do screen sharing. Play with that over the weekend so that there's no technical glitches on next week when you're doing your meetings, okay? So uh, figure out how to screen share and get it done uh, so that we can do our things next week, okay? Then what are we going to do on the very our last day of class, which is the a week from Monday? Yeah, we're going to do the game jam, basically just a dry run to make sure that, that it all works, right? So, uh, and we'll talk kind of how it's going to, going to be. So you guys basically will all share your screen at the appointed time and be streaming your game. Then I will view that with my Discord account, pipe that into OBS and stream it live, Okay. Now, on the Monday, we won't do the streaming step, okay? Or, well, I might just to make sure that that part works, right? Um, but uh, it's just a dry run to make sure that everything works, right? And I think, well, I haven't decided. I mean, I guess there's a couple ways we could do this. One would be um, to group everything thematically and do all the Minecraft projects and then do all the scratch projects, and then do all the other ones. Uh, or I could just mix them up, right? So I don't know. What what would you guys think would be a better order? Categories, like th so. Think of the viewers, the people who would be watching this thing. Which do you think they would rather see? It all jumbled up, where there's, you know, it's all mixed or in categories by Minecraft and Scratch and uh, okay what do you guys think
Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, let's do that. Let's let's just group them by theme. Um, and the the majority of people are doing so most people are doing I don't know if it's a majority, I haven't computed. Most people are doing make code arcade. Uh, the next uh, contingent, there's like, I think maybe eight or so that are doing Minecraft. And then there's like four or five doing Scratch. Um, so I guess we could do that. We could like just start with Scratch and then do Minecraft and then do make code or whatever. Just do it, you know, in some order. But oh, okay, so we'll, we'll do that. Um, and uh, uh, right. Okay, so uh, the final, right, is basically to for us to do this this game jam. And when is that, by the way? When are we scheduled by the registrar? So and finals are on Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday. Ours is Thursday, the very first day at 1800, right? 6 p.m., okay? So, um, right. Uh, we've got a night final, which is, I think, uh, I mean, would you guys rather take an exam or do a game jam at Thursday night at 6 p.m.? Yeah, I know it is, right? Um, so, yeah, we'll do we'll do the game jam. Um, that'll be a lot more fun, right? Uh, but the 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 one thing that I'm going to have you guys do is um, basically do sort of refl uh, a reflective statement kind of thing, and we'll talk about that a little bit on the last day of class. Not long. I'm not going to make you write a ten page paper or something, right? Um, but uh, but basically just to kind of talk about your experience in learning the you know, going through the video game project and what have you learned and what bumps did you run into and how did you write that sort of stuff. So nothing, nothing major. Um, but I, I do want to kind of get you guys writing a little bit. Um, okay. So, um, so then what's due tonight or this afternoon actually at, huh? What's due? The, your game. Okay which is to say the rough draft of your game, right? And in all three versions of this, Make Code or Minecraft or uh, Scratch, right? You can share these things by just giving somebody a URL, a web, web address, okay? Okay, so you're going to do that, and that's what you turn into Canvas. It's just the, the link, basically, to your project. Now, make sure that you actually share the thing Right, so if it's Scratch, you have to deliberately share the project. Right, you guys saw that with uh, uh, with your little in, little animation things. Right, so however you're which, whichever project you ended up choosing, just make sure that it's actually shared, and you can actually view it if you go to that URL. So test this by using a different computer than your own. Okay, because obviously your own computer will be cookied and logged in or whatever. Right. So do that to make sure it works, okay? So you'll upload the URL to your project, and then uh, that's due at 5, and it locks at 5. So submit it, or don't wait until 5 to do this, okay? Um, at 5.01, what happens? It's going to randomly assign you two different people's projects within the different groupings, so... All the Minecrafters will do the Minecrafters and so on, right, to do peer review, okay? And what do I want you guys to do in the peer review is basically, like, offer comments, okay? If you find bugs, make notes of them. If, uh, well, like, in many cases, the games, they're not finished yet, right? There's no sound or there's no power-ups or whatever, right? So maybe talk a little bit about, like, yeah, this part was cool. It'd be even cooler if you added blah, right? So that's the kind of thing, right, that you want to do here. And you guys have probably done peer review in other classes so far. Yeah, even you freshmen, you worms, right? Um, yeah, so anyway, um, 
Right. When are the peer reviews due? Sunday evening. Okay, right. So it's a little bit of a quick turnaround, but get it done. Okay, it shouldn't take you that horribly long. Okay, but in particular, right, you will be being reviewed by two other people. And their comments are hopefully going to help you make your project better, right? So, uh, you know, make it, um, make your review constructive in, in what you, what you do, right? Uh, and then we'll do another round of that next weekend. Okay. Same idea. Um, and, uh, but hopefully over the next week, right, your projects have matured a little bit. And so it'll be kind of the, the, over the weekend, right before the end will be the spit and shine, right. To take it from a beta to the release version. Right. Um, okay. Now, what else is due Sunday night if you haven't already done it? Yeah, retake number, th well, the basic skills exam number three, okay? Um, and Canvas is not set up to do this yet because I can't do this until you've done all of them. Uh, it will drop, so of the four retakes or the four core, uh, basic skills exams, uh if you don't do one, then it'll be a zero, obviously, right? But I'll tell Canvas to drop your lowest three, okay? I can't do that until after they're all in, though, because Canvas is weird about that. Um, so, um, so if you're happy with how you've done, okay, fine. You don't have to keep retaking them. But if you're not happy, then keep going, okay? Does that make sense? Um Okay, I think that's uh, that's everything for now. So um, so next week um, we'll be on Discord. So you can come to the classroom if you want. I'll probably just sit in my office for these, um, or you can do it from your your living unit or the library or wherever you want to be. Um, yeah. So we won't have we won't be together in the room uh, next week, but we will a week from Monday for the dry run uh, just so I can kind of, you guys can see how it's all going to work. Uh, so that'll be the last day of class. Okay, good. All right. Well, have a great weekend and I will see you guys virtually on um, Monday.